Dr. Jeremy Weiss here in this interview with Jeremy Shoe Money Shoemaker. He's just one of those people that does not hold back. He just tells it as it is. You'll find even from the very beginning when we were just chatting, I decided just to leave that in the interview and I asked him for his approval because he said some things that are very interesting. You'll want to watch it. That and much more coming up right now. Testing. Just test talk on your end and uh, see All if right. it's coming. It's picking up. Yeah. So... Yeah. What well, another thing is, the first time I went to, if I had to reflect on like all the experiences, probably having lunch with Hulk Hogan would be up there. Really? Extremely surreal. Um, what you know, What would you talk about? Um, his businesses that he's. I mean, you know, he's basically broke and and he's. Do, I mean, he's doing his WWE stuff coming back, but he's. I mean, yeah. he's a busted man. I mean, he's. And and the downside is is now as a celebrity, you know, we go out and he everyone just mobs him and so he has all the negatives of it no money i mean wow. and he's ass loads in debt so the wwe and um basically just helps him out and so he's trying to start all these businesses and one of them he started was hostmania which is a web hosting site oh. and so one of my friends funded that um for him and so brought me down to talk to him about different marketing ideas and different stuff like that. So, because nobody's really, I mean, his brand isn't really for the internet. It's more for television. So it's like, I don't, I don't, it's, it's tough. Right. So, Were you surprised I mean, just, to hear that, that he was, you know, how famous he is and well known that he was broke. You're always, I think you're always, well, I mean, yes and no. I think, I think as a business owner, I can see and seeing where I've gone in the last decade of, you know, having a 95% profit margin when it was just me out of the house, hiring contractors mm -hmm. here and there to evolving and having, gosh, 20 employees and, you know, having to make five grand every day just to make payroll, yeah. you know, um, it's pressure. So, I can see from that perspective of how, you know, when you're, it's just the same reason why NBA, NFL, all those, what is it, like 80% of them yeah, end up bankrupt or, or, or in a horrible financial position just because they get used to this, this lifestyle. And um, I did from a business perspective. And I think when I sold auction ads, even though it was a huge win for me, I decided at that point I needed to build like, a real company, you know, a real legitimate the shoe money. Company. Shoe yeah. Money and, media. And get a big office, you know? And so I started and got a big office and I think that was, it was, a, well, it was definitely a, um, a learning experience. Some would say it was a mistake, but cause I was still doing all the work and paying all these other people. And it was like, I, I'm horrible at managing people. I just, um, the best people that work for me are people that I can just show the vision to mm -hmm. tell them I want the end goal and they figure it out. Um, but managing day to day people. And then, yeah. I mean, just the whole, it got to be a job that I hated. And so about three months ago, I just decided, fuck this. The office cost me $15,000 a month just to have an office yeah. with everyone and all these expenses. I'm getting out of that. Everyone's working from home. And I, I had like three years left on my leases and contractual obligations for all these and that. And I negotiated out of them um, with those companies. And I'm back now in my basement and I fucking love it. <laughs> I really, really love it. And I got rid of some people. I merged some entities. I hired people to run other things. And I'm back to what I truly, truly love, which is just grinding and building stuff. And so my profit margins are way back up. My other stuff is... You know, and now I, I have the the freedom and the monkey off my back to actually like build stuff and not have this reoccurring revenue, this giant monkey on my back, which I don't think a lot of people can relate to because they look at me and they're like, yeah, well, you've done it. So now it's easy for you because those and it's like, dude, I envy you sometimes because like you have no you can get on there. You can go to WordPress, you know, make a free site. And I've known three guys that started on Blogger or WordPress that sold for millions of dollars, some 15 million, some more than 20 million that were all just free things within like four or five years. Wow. Yeah, I mean, so, and one guy's done it 
on two different blogger blogs. He made one about poker that he sold to Party Poker, and he made the other one about uh, mixed martial arts that sold to USA Today a year and a half ago for like $15 million. Wow. So the same guy. So it's not like it's an anomaly. I mean, the guy started from scratch again. Right. And so anyway, it's like everyone, I think like people don't realize the the opportunities that exist. It's not for everyone, but if, but it is at the same time, you know, it's just, it could be, it could be. Yeah. You have to do what you're passionate about. And that's the thing is like, this guy was passionate about poker. He shared his knowledge. He shared his thoughts on things. People followed him, um, end up getting a huge amount of links and followings and whatnot. And then he sold the site and then he did the same thing with MMA. And it's just like, I tell people like, if you want to make a blog that makes money, even though that's not like I get thrown into that category by itself, which is weird because I never, the blog has always been a very small percentage of revenue for me. It's, and I don't, cause I, I like to write about things and not focus on like what can get me more clicks to drive up CPM rates and all that stuff. So even when advertisers come to us, they would say, what's your normal stats? And I'm like, we guarantee nothing because I'm not <laughs> going to be influenced right, right. By, by that. And I'm not going to do anything misleading just to get headlines and clicks and yeah. but whatever. So yeah, I digress. A you lot. just tell it like it is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. So Jeremy, I'm going to give you a formal introduction. Do you should, do you want me to cut out the beginning part or keep it in? Whatever you want. Okay. To do, I mean, honestly. if there's anything that you mentioned that shouldn't go live, then I will cut it. There's really, there's nothing. Okay. I mean, all right. We'll, be, I mean, we'll keep it there's, in. There's, I mean, I did when I I did Andrew Warner like three or four times, and he is the and I I saw that you were mentioned on Mixergy. I don't know if yeah. you did an interview with him. Yeah. Or, or no, not, I'm but, uh, I'm the producer there. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He is the best interviewer I've ever. Nobody ever makes me like think about things. Like, is that fucker gonna bring up this or this? Because, I mean, he was like, "What was it like being fat? How did you wipe your ass?" And I was like. Wow. <laughs> I've been asked a lot of things, but I mean, I'm comfortable answering that, you know, or whatever. But I was just, he, nobody ever catches me su- by surprise. Let okay. me say that. Like, he's like a, almost like a, like a journalist, like that asks hard questions, you yeah. know, even if they're weird. But it just, he surprised me. He doesn't well, let you off the hook. On hopefully, by the end of this, you will say at least um, uh, a little bit of that. So. Uh, so, Jeremy, I'm going to formally introduce you, even though I um, want to hear your tidbits. Um, Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And today we have one of the legends of online marketing, Jeremy Schumann, Shoemaker. And he went from selling washers and dryers at Sears to creating multi-million dollar companies. He was founder of Next Pimp. Are you doing this live right now? Yeah, yeah. We're oh, good. fuck. I yeah. don't want to smoke on the thing. Can you start over? No. Why? This is real. This is real. Because <laughs> if my wife sees it, she'll be pissed. All right. <laughs> Actually, we can just roll with this. I don't give a fuck. She'll never see it. Um, I'm going to send it to her. But, um... Okay. <laughs> I don't... I mean, she, whatever. She'll deal with it. Um... <laughs> she'll never see it anyway. <laughs> he went from... See, I don't do any edits like Andrew. So we, we talk about... Don't edit. The time. Yeah. So he's founder of auction ads. He also likes electronic cigarettes. He runs Shoe Money Media, which runs several businesses, one of which includes the current company, the PARS program. He's co-founded Elite Retreat, uh, which is an annual industry expert conference. And he's author of Nothing's Changed But My Change, The Shoe Money Story. Jeremy, thanks for joining me. Hey, Jeremy. Thanks for having me on. And I hope to ask some questions that catch you off guard or get you thinking a little bit. So I get Bring into it. the Andrew Warner category since we talk weekly anyways, and I can go back to him and say, see, uh, we, we've, uh, you, I'm under you and you've taught me well. So there I like go. to include a fun fact and fun fact about you is you played in the world series of poker. Yep. Tell me um, about it. Yeah. There's some videos on my Facebook of it. I should actually, I don't think I've ever posted it on the blog. But, um, yeah, I played in the World Series of Poker, um, and it was a – I played poker hardcore for years, and I can go into why or whatever sometime. I don't want to digress too much. But, yeah, that experience of playing in that, um, I was promoting uh, – jeez, it was um, uh, at the Full Tilt Poker. And so they said, hey, you know, we're – sponsoring bloggers were paying for their entry and that time it was only back then it was like a thousand bucks so they paid for my entry 
I I made it a little bit to like third table or whatever, and um, just pretty good. Got out, just got outplayed. You know, I mean, I wasn't taking it as serious like math in my head. I wasn't in the zone. Like for me to play very very good, I have a routine. I go when it's serious time to play. What's and, your routine? Um, well, I I have to not take anything that speeds me up. So no caffeine for like eight hours leading up to it. Um, nothing. And I drink to slow me down a little bit, even, uh, mentally, because what happens is I get bored and I just go all in, you know, <laughs> I just get freaking bored and I'm like, shit, get off the pot. And I don't, and I also don't like the best I ever played. I got, um, second in a, in a very big Venetian tournament, uh, was, I think it was a, uh, it was a, an event, and not the World Series of Poker, but the the other event. Anyway, um, and so it, it, basically, I had LASIK eye surgery a week before that, but I had PRK and not the the normal one. So it takes ten days for your eyes <clears throat> to come back. And so my focus in one eye was way different than the other, and I had trouble seeing the cards. So I really, in my head, I was so I was so zoned, and it's the best I ever played in my life. And oh. I, um, you know, because to be good, you got to figure your outs and your pot odds and all this stuff and right. you know make a move every once in a while keep track of who's doing what and what they're doing and in all that and and I I would just played perfect the entire night except when I went heads up um and I was probably five times chips over the guy and he outplayed me I'd never played heads up one on one ever and he destroyed me um what did you have but um, well, we I started with like I think I had fifty grand in chips, and he had like ten thousand. I mean, what cards? What was your hand? Oh, it's just it was probably fifty hands. I mean, just just when we were oh, together, heads up. I got. He you. was just. Oh, I didn't it was realize, just the two of you. Yeah, and I'd never played one on one ever. Um, you know, in in just where you're, and I I I didn't play nearly. I folded out of way too many hands, and I just didn't play aggressive at all, and I just. I was way out of my league, and the guy just destroyed me. He wasn't even that good a player. Any, it, actually, anyone who had ever played heads up probably would have beat me in that situation. But, but yeah. So the World Series of Poker was fun. Um, it, the guys that I was playing with at the tables when you see the video is like, you know, it's like Annie Duke is over here, and like John Jawanda's over here, and like um, the guy who's the Unabomber guy who wears all his stuff <laughs> is playing with me. Right. Um, and Jesus Shuttleworth, and there's a bunch at the same table as me are playing, and 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 so at that time I knew who they were. It didn't go mainstream until poker really went mainstream, mm -hmm. and then now it's tailed back. But but yeah, I mean I, I've played with some of the best in the world, and then on side games at some high stake games where there's a lot of uh, founders of companies and stuff, um, I've seen six figure pots um, before that were. I don't care how much money you have, that was kind of intimidating. But these guys, they play that. It's so. no limit. No limit, um, fifty thousand dollar buy-in. Um, these are guys that have bought and sold companies and have a lot of high net worth. And I was a spectator at several of these. Um, I've only, I think, the highest one I ever played in was a like five thousand dollar buy-in, no limit. Um, so that yeah. was, yeah, those you, are those are interesting. Going from the World Series, you were also nominated for a presidential award in two thousand eight. Yes. Um, so for technology, uh, major companies nominate someone and eBay had not nominated anyone ever. And so when we came out with auction ads, they thought the technology behind it and, and it was, I mean, you're thinking like, why should this, I mean, Facebook was our competition, you know, I mean, like there was, uh, other, I think, uh, Kevin Rose from dig, you know, was nominated. There was, you can go back and look, but, um, so eBay nominated us, uh, and and they did all this. They they had three different companies doing background as to why we should win. They wanted somebody to win, and so they said, you know, auction ads is is improving the environment because it allows people to work from home, which is less, you know, greenhouse emissions from their exhaust and all this. And I'm just like, what? Bit of a stretch. Okay. I guess it, it, yes, in a weird way. It's, yes, it's correct. So you know, but you know, it was fun. I got to. Have, spend you know a couple hours with those guys in Zuckerberg and um, the president of eBay at the time, Phil Donahoe, I think was his name. Um, so a great experience, you know. Yeah. I watch, you so, know, I watched a large number of videos to prepare for this. 
Uh, Jeremy, one of the videos brought me to tears, and um, it was the bat attacks the shoe money office video. <laughs> yeah, that was interesting. We we had that bat in there for years. We named him, I think, Leroy. You had him in there for years? Yeah, and I, I'm sure it wasn't the same one, but I mean, just and and it would not. We wouldn't see it for months and months, and then he would be there. Uh, and it was we we always would kept the lights down in the office, and. You would just all of a sudden you just see this black thing and you'd be like, "Was that, was that Leroy?" And then, yeah, the, the I think the video, the one in particular that I published that you're talking about is probably me. It's you being yeah. a gigantic wuss, like getting up close to it, just because I wanted to show people. Because I told people about the bat, and they're like, "Whatever, whatever." And so I'm I'm like walking around. Oh my god, you know. And, yeah, you have to see the video. If I'm ever feeling down, I think I'm gonna click on that video and just watch it and. Uh... It's it's hilarious. I think it's on Facebook, isn't it? I don't even know if I. No, it's on you. I don't know. It's on YouTube for sure. Okay. And uh, yeah, it definitely whizzes right by your head a few times. So. Yeah, and everyone thinks I'm crazy because it could have been rabid and all this stuff, and I'm like, uh, you are cra- you are a little crazy. I would have been on the ground, but I'm a life experience person, and it's like I get busy living and get busy. Yeah. Dying. So, what's some of the craziest things you've done from an experience perspective? Um, in business or personal in life? or business? Um, yeah. Yeah. Personally, where do I start? I mean, I've, I've, I'm really like, I love to scare the shit out of myself, like to really challenge myself. And so they kind of cross paths a little bit. I mean, you know, like as, as odd as it sounds, it started with, you know, like just doing my radio show. I was so nervous to do a radio show. And really? Now, oh God. The first time I did a radio show. I, I did this routine. I took like two showers. I did this, like, I don't know. I just was so nervous. And then you look from there to where I've done now. I've spoken at over 75 events, right. you know, two, two major event keynotes, um, you know, and, and done a lot of other stuff. Um, God, I mean, like, I just jumped off of a 45 foot cliff um, into water. That was, that was, it wasn't as bad. Climbing up, it sucks. I was so winded like climbing up the rock face of it to do it. You but, mean, do you have to actually do the rock climbing or is there like a place for you to walk up? No, it's, it's actually on Table Rock Lake in Missouri. Um, you, they've got a 60 foot one, a 40 foot one, a 20 foot one and other stuff. And so, um, you, you have to like scale the, the, it, it's not set up for this. I mean, like you take a boat out and I saw other people jumping off and I was like, my wife was with me and my kids and I was like, I want to do that. And my wife thought I was crazy, and you have to get out and you swim, and you're in about 250 feet of water um, below you. So you know you're you're pretty safe from the cliffs. Um, but you climb up, and you, you really have to like find your footing, and then it's like crap, this isn't the right way because there's no. Then you have to circle back and pull up your own body weight, and sometimes you can't even get your footing, and you you really got to use your arms to. And let's just say it's been a while since I've been in the gym. So um, yeah, getting up there, I was just like. Whew. Jumping off it wasn't tough. I, I like stuff like that. I would love to do skydiving and other things that my wife is on the forbidden list. Um, but what else is on the forbidden list? Um, other women. Let's, <laughs> there's some other stuff. Um, I mean, that, that, I'm joking, but yeah, I'm sure there, there's not an official list. There is a. These are just things. I that thought I've it's got. like on the refrigerator. I picture like the forbidden list, and yeah, my wife is that organized that there there probably would be if we didn't have kids, and they've got their own lists um, to fill up the fridge. But the uh, god damn it, there was something I was gonna say. But um, oh, I did get permission a green slip that because I'm a huge Big Brother fan, and I've submitted an application for the last four years, and I do have the green light to have a showman's. Swear to God, a, show, a showman's. Like, yeah. On the on the you know when you have romance with another person on a reality TV show. So my wife's like, yeah. I had never heard that term before actually. No way. Everyone yeah. watching this is going to be like, what the hell? Where you been living? <laughs> no, cuz yeah, I've never I've never ever I don't even know if some of my friends 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 around here have ever I've ever disclosed that to, but my wife has officially I think I made our nanny witness it. Um so that I did have permission to uh, engage in whatever. Because, I mean, to win that show, it's so psychological and so mental. So 
you know, I'd go in there as like a single guy who is like a janitor or something like that. You can't go in like you have money. You don't care if you win, but you also can't go in like it's weird. But I think I would win that, and it's five hundred grand. It's very difficult to win, um, but it's it's so psychological that game is, and there are athletic parts to it but there's a lot of social parts of it and there's a lot of mental. And I think I have the mental and the social. I think I could compete fairly well on the athletic things, except for the endurance ones. Those would smoke me. But anyway, train with the same big brother. So, yeah. So, you know, when you said you were scared about the radio show, how do you get over that? You know, even climbing up a 40 foot or 60 foot cliff, how do you get yourself over that? So you do do those things that scare you. Yeah, uh, every time I've done anything, um, like a, a talk in front of people or, you know, whether it was anything um, like that, I, I suck it up and, and especially like going to give a keynote in front of like 5,000 people, you know, is pretty intimidating and sometimes I get a little like nervous, but I always am like, you know what, fuck these people and fuck that and you know, I did get I get mad, and then I give up, get up there and I'm comfortable. And it's weird that I, I I think everyone has their own thing that they do, um, and that's me. Like yeah. when before, sorry, anyone in the audience, I just personal. I just am like, you know what? <laughs> fuck these people. I'm fucking who I am. Right. Fuck them. I'm about to drop knowledge, and you know what? Fuck them. Yeah. I you know, and I just get like pissed, and that overcomes any sort of fear that i have i know it's weird but that's i don't me. think it's that weird at all i think you know that's kind of how your book comes across which is you just tell it like it is you you're not afraid to reveal things um how did where did the title come from nothing's changed but my change yeah it's it's really be, it's it's kind of a when i came up with it it was inspired by a rap song that i heard a, a decade ago um but but it really fits me so well because i'm still like immature um, I still love, you know, the same foods. I still enjoy the same recreational activity. I still play video games. I'm 40 years old. You know, the only thing that's changed is my change regarding money. You know, now I'm, I have a lot of money. So not, not in the wealthy class, but it's funny because I, I had just had somebody here and I, and they were like, no, no, I can't take it. And I'm like, dude, it's fucking fine. I'm rich. And so, um, I love being able to help other people and shit like that. But right. but yeah, so that's where the whole thing comes from is nothing changed. Like I'm still a very like helpful person to people and all this stuff. I'm still the same person. I say immature shit all the time and do immature things. But now I just have more money. Has anything changed the with the money? For you know, you? the only thing that really, I mean, you know, I mean, obviously the ability to buy anything you want at any time is nice. Um, I don't I don't live lavishly by any means. I mean, I other than if I a normal 9 to 5 person who makes 100 grand a year would, um I drive a Jeep Grand Cherokee. It's a new one. I buy a new car about every 3 years or at least at least. I do a one payment lease, which is a great deal um for me. Um and, you know, I mean, but the the key thing is I think and this is one of the lines that if you go to the my book page that has the thing I love the the Kindle when people highlight things it mm -hmm. shows like the most highlighted things, and one of them is a phrase I say in there that says um, having money's not everything but not having it is, and mm -hmm. it's so true because people who don't have money always say well money's not everything money's not everything and it's true, but when and this is how I grew up um, middle class was you know the decision to take a vacation or to do this was all related to money, yeah. um, whereas where I'm at now is it doesn't matter how much money I have. Like I'm at the point now where the next level that would make a difference in my life would be enough money to buy a baseball team. Like I'm not going to live my life any differently mm -hmm. until I get to that like quarter of a billion dollar level to where I could have the majority to raise the rest to buy a baseball team. Um, so, you know, like for me, I mean, life doesn't, it does. I have no clue how much money I have in the bank. I mean, within probably a million dollars, I couldn't tell you. Plus or minus a million bucks. I couldn't really tell you. My wife handles all that. She could be throwing it in an account and going to can me in the next. <laughs> I, if you have a showman, you're gone. Yeah, <laughs> whatever. You know, I mean, that could happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, like money, 
I have enough to where, I mean, I've been told this by our investment person several times is that, you know, we could easily live the same lifestyle and never work again. Yeah. And that would work for me, you know, um, if, if that, I mean, it's great to be in that position where I can take a vacation and <clears throat> the only thing I think about is my schedule. I never, the money never even matters, mm-hmm. you know? So, you know, and, and the ability to upgrade a first class if it's a long flight and I'm just like, fuck it, you know, it's whatever. So it, it, that's nice. And, you know, and, and it's just a, I don't look down on anyone because they don't or I don't whatever. Because like I said, I don't even know how much I'm worth, like total. Um, I know that I put away a bunch of cash and it better not be lost in the stock market or something like that. But, but I do have my own investment portfolio yeah. that I invest in you know, other companies and most, mostly my, my own company. Um, you talked about the par program. There's an interesting thing with the par program and that I tried to raise money. And then if you yeah, want I think me I to saw talk that email, that. you were, you were thinking about raising money. What it happened? Yeah. I mean, do you want me to run around with that? Yeah. Um, it's, it's a, it's, it's a truly interesting and dynamic story. I started, I talked to all my friends and they're like, you know, and I'm like, gosh, I'm looking to do something new. And they're like, well, you're, you know, you're successful in this. And I'm like, yeah, I need a new challenge. Like, I, w- I want to raise money. Never raise money. And I'm like, you know, I'm, it's been, I've been making money on the internet for going uh, more than a decade. I've never lost money. Um, I've sold three companies, you know, one for over 10 million. Um, I've done all this stuff. You know, I've uh, spoken everywhere. I've got all the connections to make this company a huge success. And I'm willing to give up equity, you know, money for equity because I've never had other money um, to do stuff with, and I, I just never done it. And I want to try it. So you know, they were all like, well, I, I mean, they, some of them were happy with me. Actually, all of them were happy for me except for one person, and um, it's Neil Patel's brother-in-law, Hyten. Um, if you ever met him, I think his last name is Shaw or it's mm-hmm. like S A H. I've never met him, but yeah, I know you're talking about. Yeah, I would just call him He Man. I've always have. I don't know where that came from. I think probably alcohol was involved in that name. Um, but he's he is a guy that will have a come to Jesus talk with me. And he said, You are gonna hate it. You are gonna go absolutely nuts. Do not raise money. Trust me. I know you. You're so obsessive, compulsive, get out of my way, let me do my thing. These guys will hold you accountable, want reports and all this stuff. You will go absolutely nuts and you'll end up buying them out and getting your ass handed to you. He's like, just trust me. Well, I was like, whatever, dude. So I went out in the warpath. I, I prepared myself. I had weekly calls with my friends like Andy Liu and Dan Martell and um, other people that have raised money. And they helped me put together a deck. I had a pro deck. I practiced pitch with them so many times. I had this whole deck, everything. Not like watching a video on how to do it. I had them like pitching to and all this stuff. But I still had this mentality of like, okay, this is great. But look, I haven't lost money in a decade. You know, I've made all these things. I've never lost, you know. And the ones I have that didn't work out, I still made money with. They didn't go to the moon, but whatever. And so I thought it was just like, so just fucking give me money. And just don't talk to me after that. And I'll make you money. And that, I did the, you know, I did the pitch. And, and you know, I only pitched to three local companies. And Lincoln, Nebraska is not a hotbed of fundraising activity. But they, they try to act like they are. We've got this Silicon Prairie News where they pretend like, you know, I mean, they worship guys like Dan. I mean, everything that Dan Martell says, they like bring up in their meetings and stuff. And when I mentioned him, one of the guys was like, oh, yeah, I know. It was funny because I dropped Neil Patel's name. I don't know why. And they're like, and one of the guys was like, oh, yeah, he spoke at this thing. That guy's really smart. And I met him and I'm like, I know Neil Patel. And they're like, yeah, we know him. And I'm like, no, no, no. I know Neil. Like, I bought him alcohol when he was 20. And I didn't <laughs> know he was 20. Like, know him. Like, I've spent many crazy nights with Neil Patel. Like I know, I felt like Elf in, um, you know, an Elf, Buddy the Elf, when he's like Santa. I know him, you know, and everyone's like, so, yeah. I mean, that was I was. It was frustrating because all these guys worshipped these other guys that I've known forever, and I actually was on their board of advisors or counseled them and helped them grow their companies, and and you know, and these guys worship these guys, but you know, they at the end of the day, they the the questions they they had a big problem with the fact that I had these images on my blog of like scantily clad women. Um, I'd been to the Playboy Mansion and talked about that. And I have a stripper pole in my office. The stripper pole was probably the biggest thing that was always brought up about my personal 
character and whatnot. And I was like, yeah. And I said, you know, and, and all of them, I said, you know, and if that's a problem, you're not going to be a good partner for me because I'm very upfront about it, everything. And, you know, and things like that. And people were like, gosh, it sounds like you're sour grapes. And I'm like, I am. I totally am because I'm very disappointed because this company is going to be the biggest success to ever come out of this city. And it's going to be sad that when the the story is told that I try, I pitched all you guys and you guys missed out on it. And, but that's fine because, um, we got approved for this thing called the angel tax credit, um, for the state of Nebraska. Anyone curious Just Google Nebraska angel tax credit. And how it works is if you get approved, your company gets approved and you're in a distressed area, which most of downtown Lincoln, Nebraska is distressed. Um, then you, any, Basically, anyone who invests in you um, for up to like seven hundred fifty thousand gets forty percent back from the state in a refundable tax credit. Wow! So, of course, me seeing angles and everything, um, I go to my accountant and attorney, and I said, "Find out a way I can fund this myself." So, we did, and it wasn't a big secret. I wrote about it, and I told the IRS guy that we worked with, I said, is it okay if I publicly write about this? And he's like, absolutely. And I'm like, well, I just want you to know that I'm kind of known for the guy that blurs the lines and may pushes the lines legally, morally, ethically. And he's like, no, it's everything's on the up and up, you know, blah, blah. And I said, okay. So I made the investment in my company, um, and I'll get back a check for like 260 I invested like 500 and some thousand and hmm. I'll get back a check in April for whatever for 200 and some thousand dollars so where the hell do you get 40 percent on your money for but I'm putting that money to work I mean that money's been put to work so it's not like I'm like rich get richer you know yeah 40 percent um but so that's the story of raising money I mean I I basically raised money from the state without having to give up any equity so now I can tell all these local investors, you know, some were super cool, like some were amazingly cool, but I totally shredded some of them and they, you know, it's, they're pissed and what I, sh- I just do what I do. I tell the truth. Right. And they like, you know, it was somebody had shared it in our Facebook and then removed it and apologized for it. And I said, what happened? And they said, oh, the guy, one of the guy you talked about said that you made up stuff. And I'm like, why didn't you, you know, anyway, th- so there's all these bullies locally that uh, it's a. I don't, that can go, that's a whole nother story, but I just like to expose bad people and I've been sued for it, but I think it's the right thing to do and that's what I do. So So. with that, what do you do when you invest that amount of money? What do you do? How do you start it? What was your vision for it? For the PAR program? Yeah. Yeah. So the PAR program I started two and a half years ago, it was born... I'm trying to keep this short because I know we're somewhat limited on time. Um, the PAR program was born uh, basically for myself. Like, so is auction ads, so is free SEO report, shoe money tools, next pimp. All these other companies were created because they offered a service that I wanted. And I never had the plan of making a company for these. I just built a tool for myself so I could use it and then because I only know how to do web applications. And then I let some other people use it. And then more people used it. And then I made actual revenue model around it. But the same thing with the PAR program. Like all the email platforms out there suck. And they didn't give me the tracking or the demographic ability or I hate the way they did this and I hate the way they did that. And I've tried every email platform out there. And then we had a company at the same time who came to us and said, you know, paid me to consult with them on their stuff. And we made a, a good impact with them and their, their revenue as we always do. And they said, what about you just taking all the email just off our plate? Just completely handle it. You do graphics, copywriting, everything. Okay. You know, for the right price, which was expensive. And then we, by just word of mouth, we had other people come to us. And so we started the PAR program, which is people acquisition and retention. Um, And basically our model is, you know, um, everything done from you A to Z, turning a one-time website visitor into a long-time customer. So there's various ways, and you can go to the PAR program to come and look at the video and see what we do. But um, then I had a um, some guys who I can't name publicly yet because they, they don't – I don't know if they'll ever want to be named publicly. But they own a, a very lucrative um, uh, affiliate marketing-related company, and they had bought a self-service platform email, mar- email 
company, and that company um, had very bad technology. In fact, it was down for like two months. Wow. Uh, and it has like four or 5,000 customers, though. So they said, we bought this company, and then the CEO from this other company came and was with me this week, and I said, you know what, let's build a self-serve version together. And we'll take all the core technology, which makes the PAR program awesome, except we won't manage it for the companies. and Because not everyone needs their own IP, their enterprise level, segmented server instance, and this. And you know, for the PAR program, we go through PCI compliance checks. So we've got people in the medical, legal field, financial. Um, we're the only one to pass some of the security standards, um, which is why we have some of the business we have, because they went to these other companies, and we were the only one that passed their security standards. Um, but I was like, you know, people don't need that. People just, the our platform is just so easy to use, and it's this and this, but only like 2% of our clients ever log in, because we do everything for them. So I built this awesome thing, interface, and I'm the biggest user. Nobody, I log in like 99.5% of the time if our user log is always me. So I was like, God, this thing's awesome, but nobody logs in. We just do everything for all these companies. And so I said, you know, let's build a self-service model because we've got our sales guys on that and that thing's coming along. I don't need to do anything more with that. And I, and so like now that's what I'm doing is um, I took this, so to, long answer to your question is I raised this money for the self-service version of this platform, which is going to be called Market Notify and should launch, I mean, Probably private beta within the next ninety days, and this is the new them. new one. This is a new project. Yep, Off leverage the core technology, but going head to head with Aweber and and going head to head, but doing things a lot differently. We, it's it's. I know we'll be compared to them, but when people look at it, it's what's different. We really focus more on you. You got to think like those newsletter blogger platforms were really engineered to just collect emails and send out emails, right? Nothing about, I mean, we've evolved so much and, and they keep track of your stats by, you know, you had this many opens, this many clicks and all this stuff and all that, but it's archaic. Um, there's no insight on your customers. So th if you think about it differently, your customers are really just an audience. And when they come in and sign up, We've evolved so much. I mean, opens and clicks are a very misleading stat anymore. There's a way to get a baseline, but for the most part, you know, I mean, heck, Gmail now caches the images so the opens don't show, but then every mm -hmm. mobile device automatically opens it, but then you've got firewalls and stuff that follow through. It's not accurate. The, the clicks, so, yeah, it's not accurate. What is accurate is to cookie them and then see if they visit your website or see if they click on the link. You know, to actually, because because they measure deliverability. Well, how do you really measure deliverability? Like, there's IP reputation they use and all this stuff. No, did it make it to the inbox? So you set up seed accounts. We've got like ten thousand seed accounts at every major email provider. We monitor those constantly. So people set up an email sequence, or they just want to do a one-time test. They just do test spam. We send it to various emails. Did it get delivered? You know, did it did it break any of these content filters what else do you want because once your deliverability is there and it's actually quantified in the inbox i mean it doesn't check one it checks like 40 to make sure that it got delivered or it shows a percentage of like 98 percent got delivered whatever right. yahoo aol hotmail gmail then it's a matter of conversion like opens and clicks is not so much measure of deliverability it's a measure of conversion and so that's this is just like if like I said, it's just thinking differently. And yeah. then you've got now with what you can gather from, you know, from an email, you can now through all these public APIs gather, we gather about 190 data points if they're available, like your Facebook stuff, your interests, your clout data, your LinkedIn, what people say you're an expert in, all this stuff. So now we can correlate all this together. If people can fire back a um, a, a tracking pixel and so like... I don't want to use any of our clients' names specifically without their permission, but um, they can actually look at a dashboard and say, okay, a female on Facebook who's... But you wrote a post about client muscle fire. Yeah, so there's yeah, so there's exact case studies, but I'm just saying like drilling down to specific. Oh, I see. We had a client that was spending 10 million bucks a year in a certain category because they thought that that demographic was their core, where we actually discovered that let's just call it baseball 
was their highest level of interest in their highest dollar value. Like mm-hmm. a person who comes, you know, buy something that's interested in baseball is worth 80 bucks lifetime value. Whereas a person who is interested in just to say football, where they thought it was, was only worth 20 bucks lifetime hmm. value. How'd you figure so, that out? Just from all those data points? Simple. You just correlate the data. You all have all the data, right? So now it's a matter of audiences, right? So forget about lists and all this stuff. It's your audience, right? And you, you can segment them off in different lists, but really you've got an audience. And now you can segment that audience to your auto. And, and also we have preset autoresponders. Everyone's got these preset templates. You, got, you go to AWeb or GetResponse, they've got 140 templates. How many templates do you use? You know, I've always just used plain text yeah, or made plain text, my own little right. simple thing. And this is where people need to rethink and look at statistics. And I could g- get to that in a second. But, but really your audience to where now we can say, okay, if people come in on Facebook on day one, we want to send them an email. If they're on Facebook and their female is Asia X to X, that's catered to that audience. I want to send out a promotion on this. Well, I can target that specific demographic that I'm at. I can do you know, all of these things. I can do people that have purchased something from me perp- and, and also people who have visited this particular page on my website. I can email just those people. Um, you know, so I mean, when you have all these tags, if you will, you can create a custom audience and then in, you can make autoresponders and you can send them a Twitter message if they do something. You can do all this. So now you have all these triggers. So just, it's a lot of, I mean, it's, it's, it's really, I don't even know why we would say it's a male platform because everything that we do is so much it's evolved from you just say it because people that's what people know what it is people will say like oh you're like a weber yeah we can send an email but we have i mean but but that's i mean yeah if you want to say it's an email platform right it is an email platform on crack i mean you know it's (laughs) it's I, i think it should be like an audience platform i mean like it's it's truly an maybe we should come up with a new term right now I don't know. I mean, like an audience, I don't know, whatever. Because we do retargeting, we can do all this stuff. and all. I mean, the, the capabilities I could go on about forever. Um, and, and also just the, the education to the people that sign up. Um, you know, like we're going to have pre-made autoresponders. So let's say you, because that's where like 99% of businesses and stuff fail is in the, in the auto sequence. They just collect emails, never email them. Yeah. Then they, when they do, it's a sale, and it's like one giant image, and they think that's the right thing to do because that's what GetResponse has as their default template. Right. Right. Of like, here's a Christmas template. Just make your giant image here and send that. Well, what people don't realize is a huge percentage of you know like Gmail and all these places they don't open images by default. So your company looks like a big blank square, right? And they've got to go up and click a special thing that says load images, and so there's just all this stuff we want to – we have an educational kind of series depending on what you're looking for to just educate you on best practices. So when we scan an email and we see there's a low ratio of text to image content, we want to actually let them know that and just have a video saying, you know, hey, just, just so you know, here's from our experience. We find that higher image, lower text content. We've sent, you know, over a billion emails now. So we have the data. And we know that they have a higher ratio of spam complaints, higher unsubscribe rates, less, you know, in general, click-throughs and website visits. And it's it's better just to go with plain text. I mean, right. have a general template, but plain text. I mean, and and have a conversation with your people. I always say to people, because they're like, well, this one, I'm like, what? Have you ever, like, sent this to a friend and asked them if they enjoyed reading that? Yeah. Like, did they get anything out of that? Like, other than you're having 10% off? Like, no. You know, and... For most businesses, they, they just we just think different. I'm not saying we're Apple, but I'm just saying we definitely take a different approach to it and having all this available in the platform. It's just different. It's just it's just totally different way. Yes, it is through email, but um, but it's also through social media and other things like that. So it's difficult. It's it's hard to explain it in a simple when people say, What does your platform do? It's like <laughs> well, I usually are like, what do you need? I mean, the, probably the best, easiest way is to just talk about a case example, which it sounds like you can't really talk about right now with certain customers. Um, but I had a question no, about... Can, go ahead. I, mean, depend, I can, depending. Go ahead. No, oh, no, I was going to say, you know, obviously, like you were saying, the past 10 years, yeah. you've had lots of successes, right? So what's your process for launching? When you started to launch PARS, how'd you launch it so you knew it would be a success? So... 
first of all, this has been sponsored by Victory Electronic Cigarettes. One of our clients. So that's the only reason I'm doing this on but here. Your, your wife. Honey, I was I going don't to know. send this to your wife. So can you say that again? No, I was going to say, um, what's your process for launching? You know, because you've had so much success, and I think I watched one of your talks where you said it. You you know, it did. The development took a while and did cost a lot. So it's not like yeah. just out of the gate it was uh, you know raging success just because of who you are. Yeah, I mean, fortunately for the blog, in that I've I've built an audience. Um, you know, uh, and I reach a, a decent amount of people in in a very particular niche industry of internet marketing. Um, the blog is a great launching pad. And generally what I'll do is do a private beta. Um, people still pay, you know, to be a part of it, but it's very limited. And that's what we'll do with this as well. We'll launch it in private beta. Um, and then when it's ready, you know, we'll get all the, uh, it's important to, you know, get your press releases. And if you can get on TechCrunch, you know, that's huge. Um, if you can get on all the, all the places that cover a startup launching out of beta and stuff like that. Especially ones that have raised money, they love to talk about. Um, but your core, the key thing is just, I always tell people, like, you know, a lot of the things I've done, I, I never planned for the success that it had. I mean, I never had my ducks in a row, and that's probably why I don't do some of them anymore. I mean, my next pimp site, um, and people can go back and Google that story of how that started. That thing, you know, generated, I think, two plus million some years, maybe more in revenue and um i i just stopped doing it and started looking at other things to do and it it made money continued to make money and then slowly died off and then i sold it 2010 2011 for what it made in five days in 2006 i mean crazy so i think you know from i've definitely it's been an amazing experience over the years and i've learned a lot and so this is to answer your question directly when we launch this one, we'll do it right. We'll have our affiliate program in place and everything right. And um, I've got a lot of really good partners in this one who, like with auction ads, we brought in Patrick Gavin, who had sold TextLink ads to MediaWiz. And then MediaWiz acquired a percentage of auction ads for that. And then they ended up buying out the whole thing when eBay and them kind of did their thing um, when I sold that company. So it, what I recognized was that was – why did that work? Because other than that, I haven't had a lot of what I would refer to as success. I've had a lot of learning experiences, but not a lot of big success. And then I look back and it was because Gavin was the CEO and he handled all the high level stuff and to let me do what I do best, which is grow and market and see unique angles and attack them and not deal with bullshit like employee handbooks and maternity leave policies and can I go on vacation and all this stuff that really made me not even enjoy what I was doing there for a bit. Yeah. So, you know, the plan on launching this really is going to be partnerships. Um, we've been talking with HostGator. Um, just had a call Monday with Zendesk. Have, um, you know, several large companies that see how much different we are and are just blown away by it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, working out a partnership with them, we're looking for um, exclusive partners in particular industries. So like web hosting, if HostGator gets on board, um, I think we're, we're going to do it, um, you know, then just they would be our exclusive because, I mean, right now I'm sending a couple hundred people a day to a particular email service. And just for me, this will, I'll have plenty of users right. um, to get us going. But, you know, I mean, I expect us to have, I don't know, a thousand paying customers, new customers a day by a year from now. Um, you know, and so for other companies that we partner with, obviously to have them as a resource and right. likewise is going to be huge. So really in preparation to launch it, it's it's coming up with the things um, to rapidly grow it. And, and really what you have to think about is what you can't, because some of my partners are like, well, let's look at what AWeber's pricing is. Let's look at what they do. Let's look at this. And I said, no, we're going to we're going to do what they can't do. And that's why this is going to work. Like we're going to like, like a Weber does like 30% affiliates, which seems to be across the board. And I said, you know what we're going to do? I shouldn't even say um, what I told them, but fuck it. I said, we're going to, well, no, I can't say that. Right, right, but let's just put an arbitrary number. We're going to do 75% affiliate payout. And they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah. Cause you think they can do that? 
You know, I'm like, I'm like, let's do all this. And they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, and then some of it's little things that they just can't do out of the gate that we can do. Um, it's, it's like, if you think about when Gmail launched, what was so special about it? And it was because they gave everyone what, like a gigabit of storage and people flipped out because if you wanted more than a meg or something, you had to pay hotmail like 20 bucks a month. Right. And it was like a dollar a meg or something like that. And, and all of a sudden Yahoo's like, yeah, we, what? You give away a gig because for them to compete now, they would have to, they just couldn't do it. Give away the whole service or something. Yeah. Well, I mean, now Yahoo is finally caught up in storage, but you know, they probably had to spend a bazillion dollars to put in the infrastructure to support that much storage. And here Google comes out and is like, yeah, we got this. Good luck. How do you figure out pricing then in this case? Yeah, I think the market um, definitely, and that's a that's a pricing models are a whole interesting scientific um, thing because and it really there's a there's a there's such a balance um, in the pricing model because you want to be um, people are even though we know we're different and other things like that you're going to be perceived in the same when people go to their company bosses they're going to present three things and their company bosses aren't going to give a shit about deliver they don't even know what that is deliverability or social audiences and segmenting and targeting and all this stuff um so i mean i you definitely want to price what it's worth but to me growth is way more important i'd rather have and this is where i learned like with the current par program have less than 20 clients half a million in revenue all right that's great we lose one client. That's a big hit, right? Decent hit. Where I that's not my wheelhouse what I'm doing now. It's it's working, but I'm not if you notice I'm not doing any marketing. It's all all the business is coming to us, which is I guess sad and awesome at the same time. Now if you flip it over to this other company, this is what I'm good at. I've sold you know, gosh, just the some of my products and services, I've had 60,000 subscribers, you know, to some of them at, at points in time. This is more servicing the masses is what I really love doing. And so, I mean, I think the price point is you've got to kind of look at competitively of, on a user base, even though it's not really where we want to be. So to start with, we're going to do what it takes. You know, I think, I think, and that goes with not just talking this company specifically because I'm not the CEO of this company. I am the marketing and other guy. But my my particular take on it is when you start, you got to do whatever it takes. And I'm also in a position like I was with auction ads and these other things where I don't need to make money from this company. I mean, when auction ads, when I sold that company, I think it was like 200 grand in debt. But I was doing $2 million a month in revenue. I was just paying out 100% of anything we made to our to our uh, publishers but that's what i had to do and then that company sold for a good chunk of money um and so you know when you look at this i'd rather i'd rather get to a million users like well uh, that's crazy because a weber i think the last time i looked they had something like two hundred thousand users and they've been in business for gosh 15 years something like that yeah since like 98 or something i think i think we'll surpass that in our first year Wow, and I know that's aggressive, but if you look at my past things, I mean, like auction ads, twenty-five thousand publishers, two million a month in revenue within um, one hundred and twenty days of launch. One hundred and twenty would be very months. fast growth. Yeah, yeah. So four months. I sold the company um, almost exactly four months after I started it. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, my, my track record is there, and I think we will be the largest self-serve SaaS based cloud based email platform in the world within a year. Um, so if not, I will be pissed. So, and Jeremy, you know, obviously you've had a lot of success, but you often start off your talks with, you started off from the bottom. So yeah. what did that look like for you? Cause I think up to this point, if people don't know your story, they think it just happened overnight. And, uh, yeah. And anyone who's ever calls me, know my ringback tone is Drake. Started from the bottom, um, because it's true. Um, yeah, and, and I mean, I, I was four hundred and you know four hundred and twenty to four hundred and fifty pounds, depending on the margin of error on the scale. Um, they're not super accurate when you're that big. Um, and smoke two packs of cigarettes a day. I was on a CPAP every night, wow. and, and I was I was twenty six years old, twenty seven years old. And on oxygen every night with a CPAP to breathe. Um, 
diabetes, all this shit. Bad shape. Unemployed and within, gosh, um, on unemployment, I mean, long story short, uh, you see my girlfriend encourage me at that time to just, I mean, she was a physician and I was, from the day I met her, I was on the right road. Like she was, I mean, I, I really, I'm going to talk this off in case she's here because I don't want her to get a big head, but um, she definitely deserves like the whole six, all of them, everything that I've accomplished. I mean, is all credit to her because she really, she's a, an anesthesiologist and a, a cardiac one at that. She's very specialized. I mean, it's amazing. And so she's like, everything to her is simple. It's just like, you want to be a doctor? Here's what you do. Here's the steps. You go do this, you do this, you go to medical school, residency, blah, 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 fellowships, whatever. Simple. To her, it's simple. She runs a marathon. To her, it's simple. You run this far, you run this far, you run this far, you run a marathon. So for her, it's like, why don't you have a weight loss surgery? And I was like, yeah, let's do that. So I did it. You know, and it's like, and she's like, why don't you run your own company? You have all these sites and you do all this stuff. Like, why don't you just try to do it yourself? Okay. Sounds like a good plan. And so, you know, she really kind of inspired and me because you see somebody like that and you see how hard they work and how they just put in the little amount of work per day. I mean, in the big thing, we have so much time every day. If you just progress every day, you get to this big end goal. Yeah. So for me, starting at the bottom, that's it. I mean, I was flat broke. How did you meet her? Online on uh, Yahoo Dating. We, uh, we, I actually wrote a, a script that would e- mass email everyone uh, within a 60 mile radius, all the single females that met the criteria. And even what though was I was your not, criteria, um, let's see, white, um, <laughs> age range, um, not that I have anything against other races. I have dated other races back then, but. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, just basically single. Yeah. Actually, it wasn't even single because I dated a married girl. It's all in the book, by the way. And there's some crazy, yeah, she actually wanted me to have sex with her in front of her husband. It's in the book, so you'll have to see if it happened. You have to read that. Um, but that's a true story. And I just went on a spree. And I mean, I was so fat then and everything. I was pathetic. I mean, you know, it just... There's a lot of snow around the flagpole. Let's say that. So, so were you worried on that first date? What were you thinking? With her, yeah. I thought. I, I thought there is no way this is going anywhere, but it's going to be fun, you know, just talking with her and because I love intelligent conversation, and obviously being um, achieving what she had achieved and all the school and all this other stuff, um, she was she was fun and so. Um, it's it's kind of a long story that it is in the book, but we met. I was kind of intimidated. Well, I was very intimidated by her. We had excellent phone conversations, just like really bonded over the phone. Um, never met, and then and this other girl, this friend, hooked me up with, and and she was like easy money, and we hooked up like same day we met, and she wanted me to move in, and I was like perfect because I was sleeping on my friend's couch, and then that she turned out to be a complete psycho lesbian. Um, and other stuff like that, which is very strange, right? It was in, it's in the book. It's all in the book. And um, I've had the craziest shit happen in my life. And um, I always think this stuff only happens to me. Like, it's, I swear to God. And it happens all the time. Not the crazy lesbian psycho ex-girlfriend. Help no. But so then I got back in touch with her and I said, hey, I know you're moving back to Omaha and you're not looking for anything and neither am I, but – if you want to get a beer sometime, I really missed our conversations and all this stuff. And she was like, you know, you mother, you know, um, if you want to come over, you're going to come over. I'm in my flannels. I'm not doing anything special. We're going to watch the dog show, the Westminster dog show. Cause my dog's father is competing. He actually won best in show, which is kind of nuts. Um, and, uh, so we, I did. And just from there, we grew into what now is our marriage, what has been for the last decade. So, How'd you overcome that, the weight? She was overweight as well when I met her. She was very big as well. So we kind of went through that process together. Um, me through weight loss surgery, her, her through conventional methods. Um, but yeah, I mean, so the weight thing wasn't that big of a, a thing like it would have been if, she, you know, she was super skinny at the time and stuff like that. So, but together, you know, I mean, I from the day I met her, she was like, I can't date a smoker. And I was like, I just quit on the way. Really? Here. 
Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I did. I mean, you had to, but... Yeah, and that was actually... I went seven years until I had a cigarette at a conference wow. from that day. Um, yeah, that was, that was nuts. So How did um, you do that? Because some people, obviously... Oh, I yeah, I mean, I bought gum and, you know, other stuff. Um, but there's but a you, mental aspect to that. It is extremely difficult. I mean, it's, it's very difficult. That's why, like, the e-cigs are a very good way to go if you're trying to quit smoking. Um, not just because they're better for you, but um, just because you just you get used to that thing and they're very similar in that. Um, you just It's just a, it's more like, it's not, I was reading something that was like the psychological addiction versus the physical addiction to like cigarettes and stuff like that is so much more of just, you know, just like, fidgeting you just get fidgety for like a couple months after that so yeah it's There's a lot di- of great stories obviously everyone should check out nothing's changed but change jeremy so what crazy story didn't make the book oh shit um there was at least two chapters that i had to pull um and a lot of it my wife went through and we argued a lot about and honestly for people that read it a lot of it is edited out and um someday when my parents are no longer with us and when my wife really just doesn't give a shit um then i'll i'll post the the director's cut <laughs> um but so no, what's the one you could share that you argued about with her that she did not want in and that obviously ended up not going in the book yeah, I mean, there's there's some. I'm trying to think. I didn't think I'd ask a question in this interview that you would hesitate on. Yeah, this would be a, the one. Um, and I, but I'm trying to think of specifically. There's definitely not the whole story to some of them. That not in that I'm trying to make it sound better, but it actually was worse than it sounded. Um, there's a bunch of them that my wife was just like, okay, seriously, you know, like. And, and, and my wife had no idea the success of the book because, I mean, it's at 300,000 copies now, you know, mm-hmm. sold. It's at, well, it depends on how many Barnes & Noble sells because they took out all these, but you don't get credit for them until they, you see what they actually sell. Um, but there's 300,000 copies out there. Um, and, and all my wife's colleagues she works with have read it. So I am glad that a lot of the stuff didn't go in there. So what um, What can you talk about? That- I can't. I mean, really, this is crazy because I'm such a white... Well, the one thing is I'm trying to... I mean, honestly, everything that's in the book is 100% true. Some of the stuff I said, my wife was like, is this really true? And I was like, technically it is if you look at it this way. And then she would always say like, okay, do you want people to think like this? And I'm like, you're right, you're right, you're right. So let's... Let's be very specific on this item. Um, what yeah. would you What would you not end up sleeping on the couch for like a month if you shared, but is but you still oh, kind of argued yeah. about? You're, I'm trying to think of like one one particular thing that wouldn't be like very <laughs> very very bad for me. I mean, there was a lot of stuff like forget about my wife. There was a lot of stuff about my parents that I took out of there, or people who names I named. Um, not a lot, but there were several people, um, that I named who was in my local thing growing mm-hmm. up and, and that aren't named now. One, one in particular is my bitch first girlfriend, um, is named and the whole story's in there. And, um, but there was, there's a lot of things about my parents yeah. growing up and is it parents know, stuff that you got away with or something that happened? No, with- no, just like life, like the second and third chapters were completely rewritten. The second chapter originally was a lot focused on my father. And um, he he kind of, like, let's just say that there's, the first thing was about him. And, I, I mean, it would have really hurt him if it would have come out. Let's just say that. Yeah. Um, and so I think everyone has thoughts on their parents that would offend them a lot. <laughs> Probably. Um, and so, you know, I, I ended up like not doing that, you yeah. know, and, it's not and worth honestly, it. that it, none of the things I took out were for me. It was all for other people. Yeah. Like my mom would be like, you know, you don't live here, but I still do. And I'm going to run into these people. And I'm sure, you know, they always hear about these things. Mm-hmm. Um, so we well, should move on. And then, so, well, and tell then, me this. I want, yeah. I wanted to hold the spotlight on that, but I was okay. curious because I knew there was stuff that probably didn't make the book because you're so open, you know? Yeah. 
So how, how do you become so open? Because a lot of people would not sh- ever share these things. Yeah, me, I'm completely open. So and how, if was, were you it, always it like this? Fucking, it, what's that? Were you always like this? Open like this? Yeah. I mean, I always had no shame in my game. I was always like, you take the power away from people when you have no secrets. Like, you like you know, if somebody comes out and if somebody would say, like, you know, call me gay, I'd be like, I am flaming gay. You know, just... You know, just to overtake them. You know, like that's not a God. I said that like it's a real thing, but whatever. I don't really give a shit what people think. You know, Um, you know, but you just take things to the next level and you take power away from them. If somebody thinks they, when you when you throw it out there, people know where you're coming from. And like, if you look at like the people, I mean, before I started, not I was always open, but before my story really started to get out, I would have a ton of haters, right? And they would come out and say all this stuff and all this stuff. Well, then when you put it all out there, like not only like if if you were to ask me like, you know, something like, do you think you're shady or doing this? And I would be like, yeah, I mean, depending on your definition of shady, you know, but I definitely have done some criminal activity in the past, you know, without a doubt. Well, now where do you go from there? You know, I mean, it's. I think just this is the whole thing. Being open about yourself and being who you are is interesting. Nobody can relate to the person, and this is one of the most highlighted things in my book, and, and that I didn't think was that big a deal when I wrote it. But is nobody can relate to the person that only talks about their successes. Yeah. Um, everyone can relate to the person who's been down, who fails, who you know maybe not it was asked to have sex in front of a couple, you know, whatever. But, you know, everyone's had weird shit happen to them and all this stuff. And when you, if you want to build an audience, then you have to be a a person. You can't be everyone. Like I've had CEOs of big companies being like, Hey, can you link to my blog? Can you tell people to read my blog? And I'm like, your blog is not interesting. No offense. Um, you know, but if you, if you want to write about GoDaddy and how they suck, you know, that would be interesting. I'd probably link to that, you know, but I share, and I've been sued for it three times now, um, sharing my personal experiences with people and companies. And it's gotten me in a lot of trouble, but it's also had a lot of people like a hundred times more people say, I'm so glad I read that about you because I was about to do business with this guy or I was thinking, you know what I mean? Like I hear those stories all the time. So, you know, I mean, I share the, and it's funny because the negative stuff is maybe like 1%. And actually, I had to present in front of a judge once about a post I had written. And it was like, and he said, you know, a big stipulation of what they they offered to settle. And a big stipulation was that I removed the post. And he said, I don't understand why this post is such a big deal, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, me neither, you know. And And he's like, well, it's a huge thing to them. And I said, Your Honor, it is a big thing to me. And and I said, could I just address the court and explain myself? And my lawyers, of course, are always like, you know, because they know I'm about, I'm about to perform, right? And they don't know if it's going to be good or bad. And I said, Your Honor, I feel like it is my civil responsibility to be honest with the citizens of the state of Nebraska. And because I said, do you have kids? And he's like, yes, I have a daughter. And I said, okay, if you had a bad experience with this company and you didn't share that with your daughter, And then she came to you and said, oh, I met this guy and he totally ripped me off. And you were like, oh, God, that's the same guy that ripped me off. I'm like, how bad would you feel? And I'm like, these people over here committing criminal activities who had malice and forethought to do all this. And, of course, I'm using – and the judge is like, you can't call them – you know, you know. (laughs) And I'm like, okay, well, whatever you want to call them, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And and that was it after that little talk. But that doesn't always go that way for me. (laughs) Sometimes I get myself and totally screw myself. But – it's, I'm still me at the end of the day. And, and the thing is, no matter what, I'm, I'm happy that I did it my way, like um, a Sinatra quote. But, you know, like right. I, I would rather go down and, and just raising money. Like I was not going to be somebody that they wanted me to be. That is not going to work. So, you know what? Ask me about a stripper pole and I'll talk to you about lap dances. You know what I mean? Like I'll, I'll really tell you who I am, you know, and all this stuff. So, I mean, like, and that and that doesn't work, you know, and, and it's it's not and people are like, Oh, you sour grapes or whatever and it's like, Yeah, I am. I was disappointed. I was disappointed. Um, but you know, but I still stuck to my guns and I still was honest about who I am and what I'm doing with the company and I know what they wanted to hear and that 
isn't the truth. And I know you have to play that game if you want to raise money. And that's fine. I'm not playing the game. You know, I, I'm taking my ball and going home, raising my own money and getting 40% back the first year. So. And do you talk about those companies, that situation on your blog, those posts, or did you end up having to take that down? Um, some of them I did have to take down. Yeah. Um, some of them I get creative with and like the legal stipulation will say like the content of this post must be removed. And so I'll redirect that post to another one that like copied my content. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm legally complying. Um, that's happened like three times actually out of the five or so that we've settled was they said that post had to be removed and I'm like, it's gone. And they're like, it redirects to a site that has the same thing. And I'm like, it does, you know, and they're just like, well, that was, and I'm like, you just said that I'm complying with that. That post has been removed. It is no longer on shimai.com. And so, you know, I mean, some of them are smart enough to demand that it be redirected to their particular thing. Some don't, some just, you know, I, it's, it's weird. I mean, I've I've got over a hundred thousand dollars to remove a post about a company. Right. Um, I can't. They're they're all non-disclosure. Right. Uh, but I mean, when you think about it, it's like, what's the price? And the big thing is, is that that these companies don't even realize is that there's so many blogs that send. If you take one title from any of my blog posts and you just Google it, you'll find probably fifty of of these you know, blogs, bots that just swipe content and take it. So if people really, they're going to find They'll it. find it, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Jeremy, I had that's a question. It. You know, what is, I wanted to hear a low point. What was one of the most painful moments for you? And what was one of the, you know, as your career has progressed, what's been one of the most proudest, what's been the proudest accomplishment? What's been yeah. a painful moment? It's interesting because they're very, very in a similar time frame. Um, the most painful moment, like past 2005, because I mean, before that, it was a lot of painful moments, you know, as a kid and all this stuff growing up fat and a lot of sad stories. Um, but That's a reality that, for people, though, you know? Yeah, 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 people can relate, you know, but, you know, but really the, 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 the toughest, I mean, hitting rock bottom, sleeping on your friend's couch, no future in your future. That is pretty much you're on the CPAP, you're 420 pounds, you've got no job, no nothing, you're smoking, you're scrounging money together to get smokes. It doesn't get much worse than that, right? Okay, now let's forget about that for a second. Business wise, since things went great, and then you know, one day I just kind of realized, like, I think I, my head got a little bit, I started to believe my own hype and all this other stuff. And, you know, and I mean, it leads to issues like, you know, marital issues. Everyone goes through like the seven year issues and, you know, this is this what I want to be and all this stuff. And I have amazing, and I, I, I mean, it kind of all hit me at one time of like, shit, you know, like now I've got all these employees I have to deal with. I've got these kids, I've got my wife and, and I, my kids are amazing. I love, I spend so much time with them, but I'm just, I'm just telling you like it is, you know, it's, it's just so overwhelming. Yeah. Kids got karate and CCD and this and this, and I've got this and this and this and all this stuff and employees now and maternity policies and just all this stuff that I'm not able to even do what I want to do. Um, or what, not what I want to do. Forget about that. What I need to do and, and are good at in my company. And worse. Yeah. You know, I think I was bleeding about 30 to 40 grand a month at that time. Huh. Um, and lost, you know, revenue per month. And every month, you know, I'm talking to our in-house account. I'm like, how are we doing? Oh, we're going to be okay next month. We're going to be okay. And then to find out, no, we lost 50 grand that month. Um, so all these things combined w was just like, shit, I think it's time just to retire. Because, you know, it sucks when you're bringing in a million bucks a year plus and you're not making money. And you look and you see the only streams of revenue that are very positive are a blog that you do by yourself and don't need anyone else working for you to do that. Um, and another thing, which I have some amazing employees, by the way, like not this all was my fault. I'm not blaming anyone who worked for me and my lack of and I just I really realized like I don't have what it takes to run a company. I really don't. Um, and I think that hitting rock bottom, I mean, bleeding money just every day just like losing my ass 
you know, losing in a month what a lot of people make in a year, um, you know, and stuff like that. I mean, that that was my next rock bottom from, you know, when I first found success in 2003, 2004 ish. Um, that was very difficult time for me because I know some people it's like, oh, cry me a river, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, um, you know, I didn't know what was going to happen. You know, I didn't know what was going to happen personally in my life. My, you know, there's it just like and then I kind of just like discovered what was important. And that's when I kind of made the decision to move forward. I'm getting out of the fucking office. I'm just I'm bringing in somebody to run this company um, and I'm going to get back to doing what I'm doing good at. And if that doesn't work, whatever, I started raising money to do this kind of stuff. And I raised my own money and things I'm in my basement. Guess what? I got nobody around here asking me dumb questions. Like, can they go on vacation and all this stuff? Because I have an excellent CEO in place who deals with all that. I've got an excellent CIO in place who deals with all that. Um, so one of the happiest and saddest moments are kind of around that same thing. I mean, the happiest moment is, you know, I have so much time, like, um, if I wasn't in doing this interview to with you today, don't make me feel I, bad right now. But go ahead. I've got <laughs> my my children go to school three blocks away. I get to go to 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 lunch with them, and and it's before my office was like 15 miles downtown, and so I couldn't get all the way up here and all the way back. But now yeah. I can ride a bike over there and have lunch with them in 20 minutes and be back in 45 minutes. And it's such a better quality of life right now. I make more money. I'm, you know, I don't have a giant overhead. I have, I've merged this company with another company who we've both got skin in the game. Um, well, not, not completely merged. It's a, it's a complicated situation, but we are forming a company together and they are the CEOs and this and this, and I don't deal with payroll or any of this other stuff. It's awesome. And I've been making more cool shit. And if anyone's been following my blog lately, two weekends ago, I decided I'm going to redesign the blog from scratch because I've had third parties do it. And I hated the way it looked, and I hated the functionality of it. And I'm a programmer, so a very bad one. But um, I just was like, I'm going to rewrite this entire blog, and or you know, it's a huge and, undertaking. Yeah, and I did it in a, most of it in the weekend, and I, I just started with the 2012 theme, the the WordPress theme. I made a child theme of it, and I just started taking looks and feels and playing with CSS and making different stuff. And if you look at it now. Um, the thing I don't like about it now is some of the, the comment styles, I still need to make those. They're okay, but I, they're default. Um, and then on the right-hand side, there's a few different CSS things I like to do. But like, it's got a giant background image of me and Hulk Hogan, and I was going to play with some transparency aspects of it. But it's what I want, and it's what I lo- I fucking love it right now. I love the way it looks. It loads so much faster. I rewrote a lot of the functions from – because I run a lot of custom plugins. Like I have my own marketplace where people can place listings. And- right. And then I've got – if you go to – there's a live stats page that actually shows you – um, it's a plugin that I wrote for myself that I should release someday, but I'm sure it's so bad that I would get myself hacked. Um, but it, it actually shows the live stats on the blog anytime and you can see all the people, what they're doing on the blog and, you know, and it pulls in our, um, and then we use something else that connects with our Google analytics and it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, cause I mean the blog gets in between 5,000 to 35,000 to 50,000 uniques a day. Yeah. And it just varies on what I post. And so, you know, like I haven't posted anything today and post anything Monday, but I just haven't, I don't ever force myself to post, but I've been at it for over 10 years and I've got 6,000 posts. So yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, it is what it is. Jerry, I have one last question. I appreciate your time so you can get up lunch with your kids. Um, no, I actually missed that. Oh, Thanks. make me feel even worse. Um, so <laughs> since it's inspired insider, you know, my question is, what was one of the moments, you know, when you had that huge challenge, what were you thinking about? What inspires and motivates you to kind of push forward through that? My, yeah, I definitely think um, recognizing where you're at. I mean, like having, you got to have that moment of clarity. And I think the, uh, gosh, I mean, like to, to, for me, it just happens to where things build up to a point and then I recognize what's important in life. And when you're losing money and your business sucks and stuff like that. Now, we came back that year, like shortly after this. Um, within three months, we got not only – I was about 150 k that year in the hole. We came back to be 400 k ahead. Um, that was wow. that was toughest and the best, you know, um, making that cha- transition. But 
Um, you had to push through that, you know. Some people would have yeah, just. It's the dip, right? I mean, yeah. you know, Seth Godin's. Um, I, a lot of people follow Seth, and I love Seth, and I've talked to him about him when I did my book and other stuff. And um, he's a great guy. A lot of people like him and Tim Ferriss and these guys. They they like. I, I say I listen to everyone, but I don't follow anyone. I'll listen to them. I love hearing their experiences, but let's be honest. Seth Godin hasn't sold anything in 15, 20 years. And even when he did, he was working for a company. He wasn't the man making decisions. So, you know, for all these guys who, you know, take everything he says and run their business by it, I mean, he hasn't done it himself, you know. So he did that one site that went away, Squidoo or whatever. But, um, you know, and I don't mean to knock any of them. Like Guy Kawasaki would be the first one to tell you he's never invested in anything that has made money. But yet he's like one of the premier angel investors and people listen to his every word. But so He's on the cover of your book too. I, and I like him. And he's, yeah. he's, I mean, he was one of the initial employees at Apple or, you know, whatever. And I, I, I talk with Guy. He's been to six of my events. Um, and he, but he'll be the first one to tell you, you know, that he's the, the role model for anyone who wants to do something and never work again in their life. I mean, he's like, he's, he was telling me the other day he's got a, a $2 million a year gig with the University of Singapore to give their commencement speech. That's all he has to do. Fly there, give their commencement speech. It's two million bucks. It's a good deal. Yeah, and he's got he's got to deal with Chevrolet. He's got to deal with these other companies where he like will go in once a month or be available to them if they need him. The guy, what's he ever done in many years? You know, I mean, I love and but you take a guy like, are we like we're running probably way long? But um, if I could just talk for a minute about, go well, ahead. let me answer your question. So the dip, the dip yeah. by Seth Godin. I I mean, the key takeaway is. To know, like, am I quitting this because it's hard work, or am I quitting this because it's a ble- it's going to bleed me dry and it's never going to work, and I just I just don't see the way it's going to work. And sometimes those can be really really close because on the PAR program when we were so much into development and I had all these employees and there wasn't revenue and I had focused from other forms of revenue to this, it was like okay, am I? You know, am I just because I'm burnt out on this and this and this? And I was like, no, it's because I'm not a CEO, you know, and I'm not this and I'm not this and I'm paying all these people this. I'm going to and you have to make a change. This is the thing when no matter and it, it doesn't matter if it's the right one or not. If you just continue on, then it's the definition of insanity, you know, and um, it's, you know, hoping for a different result, doing the same thing. And. That's the difference is I always make a change and, and many times frequent changes and my wife refers to it as my ability to pivot. I pivot fast like on anything. Like I decided I was moving out of the office and three weeks later – and I'm talking about a 6,000 square foot office. And is seven, that the one with the bat? Yeah. yeah. And you know, seven individual offices, huge commons area, you know – Art wall, art everywhere, all these desks, all these computers. Three weeks, that place was liquidated. I mean, I sold tons of shit. I moved tons of shit to my house. Three weeks. When I make a decision, I want it to happen tomorrow. Um, and I pivot very fast and I change very fast. And, you know, I'm, I'm usually – but but that's the thing. If you don't, then you just slowly – the ship just keeps going down. If you – you know, when you see it, you got to make a change. And if that change is to quit it, then it's one thing. If it's to, you know, stick with it. But either way, you've got to make a big change. So I've had several projects where I was asked deep in development. If somebody – I don't know if the site's up right now. There's a site, offerpools.com, and it looks like it's not up. I should – that's probably on a box. It was at a server at our office that's now in my, my other room. Um, so – that was a, an amazing site. I invested probably 200 grand in that site. Never went through with it. Just just got to the point where I was like, this is just not for me. And and I I don't regret that. Um, but anyway, I'd like to talk about John Chow for a second. Do you know who John Chow is? Yeah, he's a blogger. Yeah, right. He's a blogger. A lot of people make fun of him and whatnot. Um, um, but a lot of people follow him. But I think he much more than like. There's all these guys that people follow. If you follow his models and what he does, um, I actually learn a lot from him on a lot of things, and and actually like was like that son of a bitch like on some of these things. That guy doesn't have a technical bone in his body. Um, he started the blog writing about others that make money, and people started following him 
you know, because he would be like, oh, I made 10 bucks last month off of, you know, this thing. I made this. And then people started paying attention to him. The guy literally, like, makes a decent, you know, six-figure a year profit, um, mid six figures. He has other people write his blog for him. He doesn't, he's got it figured out. And I think if you were going to listen to someone, you should fly to wherever he's at. He speaks broken ass English, but when you talk to him and you hear about all this stuff, it's pretty, it's, it's just really eye opening to see like, gosh, I'm, I'm envious. Um, and of of the of I don't know envy is a bad one, but jealous maybe is a better one. Of just you know just how he's he's figured it out, and I'm killing myself making all these you know having all these employees and all this stuff, and that guy you know is is really profiting at this point you know more than I am, and I've got fifty times the visitors on my blog that he does, and I've got all this stuff, but he'll jump on like I thought I was too good to promote an info product. Like I was like, oh, that's a two thousand dollar product, blah blah blah. I'm too good for that. I don't need to promote that. And and then he did it, and he made like I don't know, a lot of money. So then I was like, all right, I'm gonna see. So I I do. Uh, he did John Reese's Traffic Secrets, two thousand six, something like that. So I did like I started. Uh, it was a little bit later, but I promoted like four info products, and I did like. 600 grand wow. i mean just just an affiliate commissions and i was like that son of a bitch like i but i learned that from him you know what i mean like everyone thinks i'm an expert on stuff yeah i've got my things but i mean people dismiss him a lot and the thing is he will sell out i mean like you can buy an ad on a site for 500 bucks or a mailing for 500 bucks and he started doing that moby thing and that guy is killing that thing i never promoted it i thought it was i didn't like it and i still don't like it so no offense, dude, that it's your thing. It's just not for me. Um, right. It's like kind of MLM kind of thing. It's just I've never been comfortable with those. But I could have made a ton of money with that. But, you know, but some of the things he does, I copy and will totally – I don't copy them. I outright steal them, you know, ideas. And he does the same thing with me. And sometimes he'll hit me up and say like, hey, what plugin do you use for this? And I'm like, I don't use a plugin. I use a script. And he's like, can I get it? And I'm like, well, just give me your username and password to your – your host gator and I'll, I'll set it up for you. And, you know, and, and then, and then he gets a little demanding because he'll be like, Hey, can you make it this? I need it this color. This, <laughs> I'm like, All right. This is where she really stops and your developer comes in. So, but you know, I mean, he's a really cool guy. Um, I just, I just want to people out there. Like if you really want to follow some people, like he's, he's a guy that's doing things really interesting. There's a guy named Charles Nago, N G O, which probably knew something like that. Um, no, it's no is how it's pronounced. Um, he his blog is excellent. He's and I'd love to. I only really listen to people like religiously that are actually doing shit because right. it's just it's just so valuable. So, Jeremy, I appreciate your time. No problem. This has been hugely valuable, and um, I will make sure to email this to your wife when we're done so she yeah. sees the intro. But uh, yeah, especially she's gonna love it. But it's always a pleasure, Jeremy. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks Talk to you again. later. Bye right, bye.